young, we had heroes who were sports figures, movie stars, rock stars, and television celebrities. Little did we know that we were surrounded by heroes, just down the street, around the corner, and right next door. Some of our closest relatives did extraordinary things and sacrificed so much so we could enjoy the pleasures of everyday life. These special people were men and women who gave a part of their lives to serve this country as members of the armed forces. Some served in times of war, so far from home, and some gave the ultimate sacrifice. I'd always wanted to be a Marine ever since I lived, you know, I'd go to movies and watch uh, shows like that. And uh, my brother, my brother Joe, was three years older than I am, and he was drafted into the Army, and I told my mother, well, I'm going to join the Marines. She said, no, go in the Army, and I said, no, I'm going to be a Marine. I had a hard time getting in there, but I got in, and because I was so little. Yeah, you know, they always want big Marines, you know. And I was 5'6 and weighed about 120 pounds. Frank Negrete of West Des Moines survived some of the bloodiest battles of the South Pacific during World War II. He lived just one block from where I grew up. I knew him as a softball pitcher, one of many Mexicans that played in Mexican tournaments alongside my uncles and neighborhood friends. My next assignment was Pearl Harbor. We went to Pearl Harbor to get ready for the to fight, you know. And I stayed in the South Pacific from the start of the war to the end of the war. I was uh, an aircraft in a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft battery. We spent a lot of time in the Gilbert, especially the Gilbert Islands and the Marshall Islands. Peleliu was our big fight. And when the Japanese would come over, we'd set up our guns and fire at the, at the Japanese. When those Japanese come in, you guys set up and you fire at them. They had fighter planes and bomber planes, and mostly fighters, you know, and light bombers. Most of what we would knock down would be the fighter plane, because they'd come in ahead of the fighters. Once in a while, we might get a, a bomber and we might drop them, but mainly fighter planes, you know, because they'd come ahead and they'd go on, get out of the way, and then the bombers come in. They were bigger and they were harder to knock down. I had some friends that were that got killed over there. We That one group that I had, we went to boot camp together. There were two Mexicans and uh, other white boys that I used to bang around with, you know, and two of them got killed, and we were real sad about that. But outside of that, everybody else went home pretty good shape, so I was pretty happy that I didn't lose more being in that kind of world war, you know. We come back and they threw a big celebration for us for about two or three days. They at different parties would give us dinners and uh, recreation things and they'd take us to movies and different things like that. I'm proud of all our people that served in the military in World War II. I'm real proud of everybody. I had a lot of people and a lot of friends and I was proud to serve in the in the Marine Corps. And that's it, yeah. I had some very close friends in my neighborhood about two houses up the street. I played at their house many times and knew their father to be a strict disciplinarian, whom I respected and complied with when we were told to settle down. He was also a fun guy who loved a rough house with us kids. He had this iron grip he would use on you just to get a rise out of us. I didn't know until much later who he really was. He was a real warrior of World War II and one of the most famous units in American military history, Darby's Rangers, an elite unit of commandos that wreaked havoc on the German war machine in Italy and Africa. My neighbor, Raymond Rodriguez, was a member of this elite unit. Ray Rodriguez was one of five brothers from Valley Junction who served the country in the armed forces. Raymond and Jesse were in Northern Ireland, and that was when they were try starting to form the Rangers. 
the British commandos at that time uh, in history were like the best of the best. They were the Green Berets, uh, Delta Force, the SEALs, all rolled into one. So they enlisted the help of the British commandos to uh, train them, you know, reasoning that uh, if you want to be the best, you better be trained and be able to uh, stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with the best. They had uh, well over a thousand volunteers and they only kept half of them. Monte Cassino was the monastery that was occupied by the Germans. They had artillery up there. Very difficult for the men trying to get, get past there. That is where Jesse was wounded, trying to rescue some of his buddies and earned two bronze medals there. Came home a paraplegic. When my brothers came home from the service, they came home scarred. Of course, Jesse paraplegic, Raymond had been wounded severely, almost lost his foot. His foot. Frank was not wounded, but came home with a lot of demons. They very, very seldom talked about their war experiences. Occasionally they would, but not very often. They lost a lot of buddies there. They lost, they saw a lot of atrocities, committed a lot of atrocities when you kill another human being. That cannot wait very good on you. We're a very patriotic family, uh, but I love my family, I'm proud of my family, and I think that's one of the things I got from my dad. I think we also got is his inner strength. My brothers that served their country with integrity and pride. We come from a very military family. I especially was very proud of my brothers. Magdaleno Torres was a jokester who loved to tease and play with his nieces and nephews and grandchildren. He was my uncle and one of my heroes. Originally from Oklahoma, he settled in West Des Moines and married my dad's sister, Rita. He was a hardworking man who worked right through everyday pain of injuries he suffered in World War II. As a tank gunner in the 753rd Tank Battalion, he was awarded the Purple Heart and Bronze Star. We had lunch on Veterans Day a couple of years ago before he died. I always try to imagine what it must have been like to fight in the places he did so far from home and under some of the harshest conditions. He talked about the constant barrage of German artillery and bullets raining over him and his comrades. It was one of those moments that I felt my life was so insignificant and small as I sat in the presence of this old warrior. The end is dark, the town is sleeping Now the time has come to part, the time for weeping Vaya con Dios, my darling Vaya con Dios, my love The Korean War was called a conflict, as if it was a disagreement or argument. It has also been known as the Forgotten War. One World War II vet told me he didn't like the name conflict. He said that was no conflict, that was a war. It was a terrible place and a lot of guys died there and didn't get the credit other vets got. Growing up in the 60s and 70s was a unique time. The music, clothing, and cultural scene dominated the media. 
The nightly news was filled with scenes from Vietnam, graphic battle and images of Americans being killed. The country was being affected on a political and moral level by this televised war. There were many demonstrations against the war and even against the young Americans that were fighting there. Some of my friends served during that time as well as many other West Des Moines guys that I knew. I got my number picked for the draft on like a Friday and uh, the following Wednesday I went down and talked to the uh, recruiting sergeant down on 5th Street in West Des Moines and he told me that I was going to have a certain date that he thought I would be called up on and I didn't want to wait for that date so I went home and uh, told my mom and dad I'd signed up to go into the into the service. Um, I reported to go uh, to start my basic training on Monday so uh, within a week's time that's that's how quick it happened. I didn't have any idea what that really meant to me until we finally landed uh, on the ground in an airplane and they threw that door open and we stood up and we got and I got to the, my turn to leave the plane and the smell and the heat of Vietnam just in, enveloped me and I looked down on the ground and there were a plane full of guys with this look on their face that they just couldn't wait for us to get off of that plane so they could get on that plane to come home. But all along the way I carried uh, the experiences that those that went before me. Uh, my father was in the service. Uh, his two brothers, uh, they were all in the army. Uh, I had an un several uncles uh, that uh, served the country in the uh, Navy and the Marines, uh, so we had all the branches were covered. I don't think that there's one family in, in the uh, Mexican community that I can think of that uh, didn't have uh, representatives that uh, uh, served their country in one branch of the service or the other. 1966, about July, I received my draft papers, uh, finished basic training, had an MOS as 11B, that is infantry. Went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for my advanced infantry training. They assigned me to go to Fort Knox, Kentucky for APC training, armored personnel carrier training. So we flew, we were supposed to fly into Saigon and Saigon was being shelled. The runway was all pockmarked so they uh, diverted us to Cameron Bay. As we got off the bus, the guys coming back that were going home were, was getting on the bus. They were still in their fatigues. I'll never forget this. The look on their face. Al was talking about the deaths there. You had to see it in, in the other troops' face. But somebody that's been in combat will understand that. It's a lot going through you just reading right through them and they have seen so much, they can't even talk about it. There's too much build up in them. 18, 19, 20 year old kids and they look like they were 40 years old. That was tough. And I, and I said to the guy that I was with at that time, I said, I hope I don't look like that when I come back. The, the, the jungle was pretty torturous on all of us and whether you wanted to or not you smelt like the jungle you were the jungle and, and, and you grew into the jungle because the jungle gets so thick sometimes you don't even know where in the hell you are you're just walking you're just walking through it triple canopy sometimes you get in a triple canopy and there's no daylight it's dark it's like dust all the time and there's always seems to be musk or, or uh, uh, humidity, humidity in the air, all the friggin' time, man. I mean, twice as hot as yeah, it is you, here. You couldn't get away from it, even if the sun's not shining on you. And I see snakes so big, I, I you know, I, I don't well, have nothing big enough to measure them. Yeah, there's not the big ones, them small ones, them little vipers. bamboo vipers. Vipers. Two steppers, they call them. If they bit you, you got two steps, and your ass is done. Everything in this one area, Ugh. I've seen flowers bigger than men. I'm talking about the petals are bigger than a man. It's like nobody's ever been there. 
Okay, I was a big complainer there, and I complained that uh, we had never been in any action. We had a couple of weeks guarding the highway. One, no sooner than I said that, the next day they took us out. I went out one time, it was, it was like three months later before I seen a bed, and I didn't even see a bed, I seen the ground. But that's how long we went out and never came back. I called fire missions and uh, never, never had a person with a scratch on them. So you hit the target that you were supposed to hit. I hit the target right? every time. That's, that's the accomplishment you know, right there. So that's, that, that was the big thing. That was the pat on my back. For two days we stayed there. We had VC all around us, and I mean frickin'. You can hear them. You can hear them talking at night, rattling their shit to let us know that they're there. So that third day, uh, Started the third day, well, that second night, we walked in artillery as close as we dare walk it in. And then that next day, we start out. The, we, we've got resupplied by the choppers, we got our water, we got uh, ammunition, because we let off a lot of ammunition them two nights just to make sure they wasn't coming in. So that next day, uh, we walk out of there, we hit a ridge line, and we set up camp that night. We had dug. We had dropped a tree to get the chopper in. We had zapped it. The tree had just fell right in front of where my squad was. My platoon was set up in this area. A tree fell right there. And uh, as I'm changing, I, I'm wet. It rained the night before, so I'm changing my, my pants. I had a dry pair of pants in my uh, pack with uh, inside plastic. Put on them pants, and I was reading a letter from my sister and uh, drinking a Coke. Didn't have any beer, man, drinking a Coke. And so all of a sudden I, I look up and didn't even hear the sound, seeing the tree bark dancing off that tree, and then I heard the sound. And then the next thing I knew, I was laying in the bottom of this hole with about five guys jumping on top of me. So I asked the guy on top of me, hey, is there a hole in front of my pants? Because I just put on a brand new pair of pants, dry pair of pants. He goes, yeah. I said, is there one coming out the back? He goes, yeah. And I said, call Doc, because I, I didn't know I was even hit before that, before he told me that. So me and Sergeant Slay, he got hit in the chest. They uh, carried us up to the tree line, and the choppers came in, got on the chopper. Doc threw me on the chopper. Hey, see you in about a month. Well, the gunner on the chopper says, where are you hit, man? Because he seen my leg all bandaged up and said, I, got shot close to the knee. He says, man, you got a million dollar wound. He said, you're going home. Cried like a baby. Nice to think about. I didn't want to think about it because I didn't think it was true. I just said, <laughs> why would you tell me that? Yeah, they're all, they're yeah. all. Yeah. We lived on a farm at that time, and my, I remember my brother coming home um, because we didn't have television in those days. We didn't have a radio, and he came home uh, saying that we were at war. And the first thing my father thought about was my older brother, Bernardo, who was stationed in the Philippines at that time. And so th there was a lot of concern. That meant uh, my younger brother would have to go also. And Bernardo was in the Philippines and was captured. He was in the... Uh, Bataan Death March and survived that and it was an 80 mile hike. Not all of them survived. Uh, he would write us letters uh, and they really weren't letters, they were more postcards uh, because they were limited on what they could write and how much they could write. But the things that he emphasized most of all was please write to me, keep me posted and do not send food. You could uh, send anything else but food because they weren't allowed to keep it. The Japanese would take the food and eat it themselves. My brother survived until uh, 1945, almost the end of the war, but it was like three months before the war uh, was over, and that he died a prisoner of war of the Japanese. And my brother Buster uh, was in the Air Force and he was training to be a bombardier. And in training in Roswell, New Mexico, two airplanes crashed in midair and there were no survivors. When all this happened, 
uh, my father, I could see him very, very sad and uh, his health then began to deteriorate um, because of the two deaths in the family. Uh, there was great pride uh, to s uh, save our country and uh, all over um, in Des Moines, West Des Moines, the South Side, all our young men were uh, enlisting. In Valley Junction, the majority of the Latinos were of Mexican descent, and uh, every family sent someone. We even had a family that had a, a, a brother and sister that served in the service. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Des Moines Art Center Day of the Dead Committee for honoring our veterans. There are so few left, and this is a good time to honor them for their service, their courage, and their sacrifice that they made for our country. La luna me dice una cosa, las estrellas me dicen otra, la luz del día me canta esta triste canción, esta triste canción. Los besos que me diste, mi amor, son los que me están matando. Ya mis lágrimas se están secando con mi pistola y mi corazón. Y aquí siempre paso la vida con la pistola y el corazón. 